please welcome Kari Pulli. Thank you. So um, I'm actually uh, between jobs this week. I left light last week. I will be starting at Intel uh, next week. But um, this, uh, oh, does this work? No. All right. Okay, so I'm going to try and cover three topics in this uh, 30 minutes. Uh, I've been working mostly on computational imaging, but I also a little bit on computational displays, and Atanas uh, asked me to talk about displays, so I included one project there. So the first two projects are from NVIDIA Research, where I was until about a year ago, and then the last project is uh, from Light, a startup in downtown Palo Alto, where I spent the last year. So high resolution displays are at the heart of modern consumer electronics and uh, there's, there's lots of reasons to high, uh, have a high resolution display other than just seeing your movie on, uh, across the whole wall. There's for example this new uh, kind of modern displays that Jenny just uh, described. So one way to get rid of this virgin accommodation uh, problem is to have light field displays. And, uh, but the, uh, one, one problem there is that you need very high resolution display panels. And now, now if the situation is that the current state of technology doesn't uh, provide those uh, display panels, uh, what do you do? So we looked at this and the idea was that we take one uh, display panel and here are kind of the pixels. They typically would be a little bit smaller than that, but just for illustration. So let's take another panel and put it on top of the first panel. And uh, we should uh, offset the second panel so that um, the pixels are slightly shifted. And uh, in fact, they should be shifted by half a pixel at each pixel. So then you get this, uh, this kind of illustration. And now if, we, uh, those are, if you think of this as an LSD pan LCD panel or... <laughs> Well, with, L with LSD panel, you might get really interesting vi <laughs> visions, but um, if we stick with uh, LCD or, uh, or projectors, you can use the same, same idea with projectors. You can then kind of think that um, we get these um, sub-pixels like quarter or pixels at the intersections of these uh, d two panels. Now, you'd like to address these uh, pixels, these small pixels, so that you would uh, give this high resolution image. And clearly that's not kind of possible uh, for, for all the images because you just, you have like two times, uh, if, if the number of pixels in one panel is n, you have two times n uh, things that you can control, but you need four times n uh, pixels in the output. So that's a problem. But uh, if you, use a little bit cleverness, it's, uh, you kind of can address that. So here is a target image, and if we zoom in, we can see, see it like what you would see in a conventional display, but then with this cascaded display where you use two panels, you can approximate the high resolution quite well, especially with video, but also with still images. And there are several approaches how to do that. So. And, and this illustrates that the images that you display on each of the layers, they, they don't necessarily look very good. But when you put them on top of each other and uh, the, this, these colors kind of modulate each other, it, it will look much better. So let's see how that works. Um, so we have these two panels and we have this uh, green kind of sub-pixels that we want to uh, create and control. And uh, now we, have, uh, we can control the content of the back panel. And let's uh, describe those pixels as a kind of, we'll make this very long vector, A. And then we have the front panel and it has its corresponding uh, pixels that we can control. And we can mark those as a, a row vector or, or another vector B transpose. If we take outer product of these two vectors, or the, all the two pixels in the front and back panel, we get this matrix T. 
But that's a very big matrix and we don't really care most of the elements. We only care of these kind of um, uh, green pixels where there would be four green pixels at each row. And those, th those are the ones that we actually see where the pixels in the front and back panel, they overlap. And uh, here's an easy way now to figure out the right content for these uh, green pixels. So if we do this kind of time multiplexing, so we take the front panel and uh, make three out of the four uh, pixels opaque, so we, uh, they are completely black. And we leave only this, this kind of, well, ugh, that, that corner pixel on. Then we have uh, four other back panel pixels there uh, that, uh, yeah. So we have uh, this back panel uh, uh, pixel that overlaps with this front panel pixel. And uh, it's, it's quite easy to figure out when we fix first the color of the front pixel, what should be the color of the back pixel to pretty much have an arbitrary color here. And we can do the same thing uh, over here and over here and over here. And then for the next frame, what we do is uh, we just uh, shift which pixel we sh uh, show. And then we do that two more times, frame uh, three and four. And now uh, what we do that we just mul do that very fast. And uh, we, 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 we sh show these kind of four frames that we can cycle through. And if we do it so fast uh, uh, that the eye can't really like tell them apart, the eye will fuse the information. And you will see the high resolution information there. Now there are a couple of obvious drawbacks. One is that you have to create four images, so it takes four times uh, longer to do that. And another uh, problem is that you lose uh, 4x light because at, at every frame you turn three quarters of the pixels opaque. Um, but it, um, let's, let's look at the situation in a different view. So these would be now those four uh, pairs of, uh, well, pixel contents uh, that, that we cycle through. So uh, as, as we uh, kind of showed, it's, it's possible to get this um, rank four approximation that uh, was actually not an approximation, it's exact for the green pixels that we care. But um, we don't really like necessarily need the whole rank four matrix. We can make a coarser approximation. We can, so now, now uh, what, what we want to do is we want to find a low rank approximation for the information in um, A and B that gives a good approximation for the green pixels. And, um, but there is a trick. So we can't use the singular value decomposition, for example, what we would normally do, is because all of these have to be non-negative. We can't shine negative light. We haven't invented that technology yet. So we can all, uh, since we can only uh, uh, have actually like choose from zero light to some uh, amount of positive light, all of these components have to be non-negative. So we need to do non-negative matrix multiplication, kind of weight it so that we, we only care about the green pixels. And uh, it turns out that there are fast algorithms how to do that, especially for rank one approximation. And it turns also uh, out that in most cases, just, just showing one image pair, it's good enough. It's, it's very close to the uh, image that we want to uh, get. So it's uh, demonstrated here. We had uh, at SIGGRAPH, uh, we had emerging technologies. And these are just two printed foils. So we can't switch the images. It's just those images that we have. But if, uh, if you take those foils and you align them on top of each other, you will see that uh, kind of, I mean, if I go back here, the high resolution, uh, the target image that we want to get is here. And here would be the same image at half of the resolution. And at the bottom layer, they would be, again, at, at the same resolution as this, but two layers. But if you overlay those two layers, uh, create a very good approximation of this, this high resolution image. 
So, so you can basically see uh, with your own eyes and hands that uh, this uh, rank one approximation actually works quite well. Uh, we can also do sp uh, uh, time super resolution. So if we, if we just uh, change the content of the front and back panel and we offset uh, the, the refreshes, uh, we, can, we can kind of upsample also the time. That changes slightly the mathematics, but, but not much. So, so then, then it kind of looks like this. You would, uh, you, you could, uh, we demonstrated this, that the individual layers are up, uh, updated at 5 hertz, but then the visual experience is that you get uh, 10 hertz uh, display refresh rates. So we can, we can, from the same displays, we can upsample both space and time. And here's sir. The interface boards are screwed to the a prototype plate that with one built. LCD mounted on top. A quarter wave retarding film is affixed, and the second panel is arranged to achieve a cascaded display. To allow head-mounted display, an inertial measurement unit is mounted to the rear case, and a lens attachment is affixed to the front. Here we show spatial super-resolution results for still images. Notice the enhanced details in the feathers on the right. Similarly, compare the sharpness of the forehead. The prototype also supports spatiotemporal super-resolution. The same sequence from earlier is shown, now captured using a video camera to record the cascaded display. Okay. So let's move to the next project. This was also done at NVIDIA Research, and uh, Karin Aguizarian uh, was also participated in this work as he spent uh, part of his sabbatical visit uh, in, in our research team. So uh, this is a diagram of an ISP image signal processor, like all other cell phones or digital cameras uh, has something like that inside, where, you, where the information kind of comes from the sensor and then you have this sequence of operations that you do it kind of one algorithm at a time that you apply to the data as it kind of runs through the pipeline and out comes to uh, hopefully the good image. There are some problems with this approach. One, one is that, uh, well, you have to have this particular order for all of the images and you don't know in advance which, which image comes and then, uh, well, then as the uh, information goes through, there are some small errors at each stage and the next stage do doesn't really know like how much uh, of the information is real and how much is error and these errors start accumulating. And to minimize these errors, you then very carefully try to tune the algorithms and uh, these uh, stages uh, with, with each other. But that le leads to the second problem. If you make any kind of uh, change to the system, like different kind of optics, different kind of sensor, different kind of imaging model, this, uh, you, you can't do that. Like this is very rigid. And, uh, and then you basically have to kind of start all, all over again. And that's not nice. So we, uh, this, this work was uh, taking this standard image processing pipeline and replacing it with this um, kind of modern optimization, uh, iterative op optimizing pipeline where we have this optimization algorithm that compares the current image with uh, the input, raw input image and see if they are compatible. And that way it can figure out if there was some er errors that were introduced. And then we have these natural image priors that kind of tell us uh, what, what is a good uh, input, uh, what is a good uh, output image like. So we have this uh, optimization pipeline and we demonstrated it uh, with several different uh, imaging applications. One is traditional um, uh, demosaicing of Bayer images. Another one was that uh, we take a burst of images and do denoising and demosaicing at the same time. 
And then we had this interlaced HDR camera and uh, this kind of uh, four cameras that have their separate color filters. But I, I'll just cover two of these. So as part of the system, we need to understand the image formation model. So if this is the input image and the light comes into the system, it first comes via the optics, the lens, which in, uh, introduces some blur. And uh, then there's the color matrix, uh, so that each pixel only gets one color, and then there's the sensor. And you get this Z is the information that you actually capture. But now this is the real image that we are trying to model using all this information. We don't know this, uh, this uh, part, but we can model it now. That uh, given the ideal image and kind of with the system imaging matrix, we can get like what do we think the measurement should have been. And that's, that's, the, that's what we try to, that's the error that we try to minimize. And uh, the problem is that this ill posed. There are many images that could, could create the same image that we actually measure, and especially when the noise is in. So now we need this regularization. And we regularize it with three different components. Those are these like, kind of natural image priors. One is total variation, like minimizing the absolute values of the gradients. If we only run this, the output, uh, output is something like this. So we kind of throw away small edges, but keep the strong edges. So that's kind of good, uh, like lots of the noise goes away, but the image is posterized. But alone, it, it would be not, not good, in, good enough. Then we have this cross-channel uh, uh, criterion. The idea is that if this is a good image, the data should look like this. If this is kind of this chromatic aberration, the, uh, you, you can see that the kind of shapes of the different color channels are different. And uh, we, with this constraint, we want to, like, even if the input image is like this, we want to constrain that the output image, all the channels kind of have the same shape locally uh, of the data. And that, that gets rid of these, like, chroma problems and so forth. And then finally, we, we use this uh, collaborative denoising. So the idea is that if this is a small patch of an image, there are neighboring patches that are quite similar. And if you kind of look at them all together, you can do denoising and um, get this better, uh, better kind of output which you put there. So this th uh, total variation, cross-channel component, and self-similarity denoising that would go the, uh, to these regularizers. <coughs> and uh, we'll solve it with a modern primal dual optimizer. And uh, these individual components, they would come proximal operators that they are fast to evaluate and they kind of give good results. So one of the use cases was this burst uh, image capture. One problem wh when you always, when you capture burst images, like in, uh, images in sequence, is that you have time between the images. And now if there's moving objects like the car, or even when the camera moves because it's handheld, you have to deal with that. So our system model is the lens blur, the color subsampling, and then uh, optical flow field that we just estimate uh, doing registration. And this is just the, uh, uh, it's the, reliability of the opti uh, So for example, in this area, we don't think it's very reliable. We, we take that into account as well. So here's a picture of uh, one of our uh, colleagues' basement uh, taken with a DSLR in very dark conditions. So individual frames are very bad. And if you uh, uh, like use state-of-the-art denoising BM3D on this, this frame, it's still, well, it's better, but it's still bad. If you use all the frames using something called video BM3D, you get a little bit better results. But then again, if you use this, uh, our optimizer, uh, which, which does demosaicing and denoising at the same time, you get higher, higher quality output. And this would be the crown truth, just taken with longer exposure time. We also demonstrated this interlaced HDR. So, uh, this uh, kind of special camera that exposes alternative sc scanline pairs, like th this one gets a long exposure and short exposure and, and so forth. So you can take HDR videos even.
But the problem is that uh, really to get this, uh, if, if the scene has high dynamic range, then the short exposure, most of the pixels are really dark. So you lose the information. And the long exposure, well, some of the pixels are too bright, so you lose information there. So, so there are lots of pixels that you actually don't uh, get. You never capture. And we just mark it in a, this kind of mask that these black pixels are kind of bad. They are saturated. So now our imaging model is the blurring, color subsampling, and uh, mask or validity of the pixels. And here's a scene from the kind of, um, in, in front of our, our research building at NVIDIA. If we look at this detail, we can see that there's, uh, well, lots of information missing. And here are two kind of previous works that tried to capture the image from this information. And if we look at these areas, you can see that there's lots of aliasing. Whereas uh, our method using this uh, good image priors, in particular the self-similarity prior, was able to get, get much kind of higher quality image output. And we were able to run this in real time using desktop GPUs. <coughs> okay, so in summary there's the Flex ISP framework that takes the images and understanding how the images are formed and uh, creates good images by uh, running it on GPU. Okay, so the last project and the thing that I've spent last year on is this light camera. So light L16 camera. The 16 means that there are actually 16 different camera modules in, inside of this. Uh, the, the device is about this big, like about two, two centimeters thick. And the idea is that you would want, uh, you want to get as good images as you can get with a DSLR, but you want to do it in something that you don't need an extra backpack for. So here's a marketing video. I this. own the and I own, you know, expensive DSLR cameras and lots of expensive lenses. You know, even though I had all this gear, which would take phenomenal pictures, I found myself taking more and more pictures with my cell phone because it was there with me all the time. That's when it occurred to me that if we can make a camera which has the same quality and features as a DSLR camera, but it is in a form factor that can fit in my pocket and stay with me all the time, then I'd be taking much better pictures all the time. Right? Over the last 150 years or so, you know, of photography, camera design and architecture hasn't really evolved very much. What we're trying to do here now is to capitalize on all of the innovation that has resulted in very inexpensive camera modules and inexpensive high quality lenses. We're trying to replace a big lens with multiple small lenses and small sensors. One of the things we do to keep our cameras very thin is something called folded optics. You have an aperture, light comes in through the aperture, strikes a mirror, and then travels down the barrel of lenses laid horizontally in the body. We are actually using 16 different camera modules at three different focal lengths. The users can then simply pinch and zoom the picture, and depending upon what field of view they finally end up selecting, 10 of the 16 modules will fire and take pictures. And then we use sophisticated computational imaging algorithms to combine those 10 pictures to basically create one really high quality picture. Our software can figure out how to set the exposures differently for different cameras to get great low light performance. The other incredible thing we offer is really infinite depth of field control. Everything's kind of in focus when they compose it, but I know I'm taking a picture of you and it's a portrait and I want a nice blur in the background. I can go set that after the fact. This isn't just moonshot thinking. We put some of the best talent in Silicon Valley together here at Light. Our computational imaging team and our hardware team have been working for over two years to bring this to reality. Now, we've partnered with the world's leading contract manufacturers to actually deliver a product to consumers. Why I'm really excited about this camera is that it puts the focus back on great photography, not just great technology. Okay, so this, uh, this camera was announced two weeks ago. It's, it's now available for pre-orders. Uh, you can uh, actually, only within the US, you can't order it to Finland, sorry. 
Uh, it's going to cost about like $1,600. So, so the idea is that this, this would be a replacement uh, for a DSLR. And uh, OK. So here's a picture of a different, like the idea is also that Light would uh, license the technology for cell phone ma ma manufacturers. So this is a rendering. This is not the real thing. But it, uh, it, it's going, likely going to be a real thing, something like this. Uh, so uh, Foxconn uh, is, is a partner uh, for, uh, to Light, and they are actually planning to make an Android phone uh, with, uh, with Light camera. So this model would have only 11 cameras. There would be uh, these. These are like the same kind of cameras as in a regular cell phone. They would have the kind of field of view comparable to 35 millimeter DSLR lens. And uh, then several of these would be, uh, would have uh, the 70 millimeter equivalent. So they have kind of twice the zoom. And one of them is 150 millimeter equivalent. Uh, this is a photograph of a prototype for this L16. So here you have 16 cameras. So five of them are the 35 uh, millimeter, uh, five of them are 70 millimeter, one, uh, five of them are 100, 150 millimeter. So for example, this one is one of the uh, 150 millimeter equivalents. So it's quite large. It's like, I don't know, like over three centimeters long. And that would make the whole device too thick. And that's the reason why it's kind of turned to sideways. So, um, so if, if here's the uh, optics, here's the sensor, and here would be a mirror that turns the light uh, by 90 degrees. So that's, that's the folded optics there. The mirrors can actually tilt a little bit. So you can modify the tilt. And that changes the field of view like the, uh, where, where, the, where the camera actually points. And uh, that is used when the user zooms and also for allowing you to get high resolution. So if we look at this image, the dotted line, the big image, would be the field of view of the 35 millimeter camera, which is kind of the base camera. And then the 70 millimeter cameras, all five of them initially would be pointing straight ahead kind of to the center of the image. But if you want to get the high resolution uh, of the 70 millimeter uh, cameras to the field of view of the 35, you can move each of them to, uh, to corners. So one of them is uh, the uh, mirror tilts so that the image kind of moves from here to here, and another one here and so forth, so this kind of small animation. So in the end, you would get these four images covering and tiling the large field of view. One still remains at the center, kind of providing, um, because individual cameras, they always have the best information in the center. One remains on the center. And uh, this is actually my last slide. So um, now I can answer some questions for a couple of minutes. And uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you. <laughs>